much, Dave. Um, it is really very special for me to be here. Um, Dad had a great joy of road trip, but he had a great joy also of sailing and the inherent social mix in that. Um, I think I was destined to have a sailing, a life in sailing. Uh, my grandfather Colin sailed dinghies off West Beach as a young man, and I remember stories of them pulling the boats up and down the beach by horse and dray. He went on to build over a period of four years a classic hair shop, uh, a 28 foot yacht called Fiona in the backyard. Um, that was in Myrtle Bank, and that was with the help, the help of a teenage Peter. So in the household, our houses now, and our family now, the Fiona boat building film is part of the family law. Um, I have fond memories of Colin and Papa explaining the process of building a wooden boat. The lead hill was cast in a mould in the ground after much scrimping and scraping to get enough lead, including collecting toothpaste tubes from family and friends. Um, the Kielsen plank, and that's the plank that connects uh, onto the keel and gives longitudinal strength to the yacht. Uh, that was carved in the yard. Uh, the wooden planks, all the planking along the side of the boat, were steamed and then fitted uh, all in the backyard. The only professional help that they employed was to cork the yacht. Uh, that's a rather important step to make sure that she doesn't sink. Uh, Fiona was more of the squadron, and certainly I know that there are a few people here that are still involved with the squadron today, and uh, Dad went on to own Fiona, and uh, that's probably where my involvement in boats was cemented. And there is the lovely Fiona. Uh, my independent sailing uh, really began when we moved to Calgary, uh, which is in the, on, on the prairies in Canada. Uh, my, I was eight, my brother and I went to sailing school, and during summer holidays, really it was a babysitting service for a lot of years. <laughs> Uh, but that's okay, we had sailing background. So for us, it was the most amazing summers. And, you know, it was highly social, it was a lot of fun, and we would decorate the boats for the Pirates Day, and we would, you know, play boat soccer and set up little races. Um, and it was a really nice way to grow up, even though we were on inland and made lakes in Canada. Um, we, uh, it, the Canadian Yachting Association, and in fact most of the countries have a series of badges or a series of levels when they teach sailing. So we went through that program and it very much leads into racing if you're so inclined, and apparently I am so inclined. Um, I started racing both single-handed and double-handed boats in um, Canada. And initially they were both something like this. This is a 420 that I moved uh, to once I got back to Australia. Um, but uh, that was at the Calgary Yacht Club, and we went there as a whole family. Mum and Dad sailed on a, a, a very flat boat called a Scow, a Y Flyer. Um, I sailed on lasers, and uh, my brother would crew for others. One of the tricks about sailing in um, Chestermere Lake, it was called, is that all around the edge, and actually, so it, it, it used to come a fair way in, it was very shallow, and so the biggest problem we had was weed. So you could win or lose a race whether you ended up in the weed. I distinctly remember, however, you know, Canada um, certainly has a very cold winter. And at the um, uh, end of the season, uh, I, I do remember having to de-ice the boat before we could actually go sailing. So that was my start to independent sailing. Uh, we moved back to Adelaide uh, when I was 15. And I found Brian the Secret Fjord Club. And this is where the 420 world started. Um, I had to learn how to sail in waves. Not a lot of waves in the prairies. Um, and it really was a whole new skill. And I capsized and, you know, all of the, all the learning lessons. But um, I loved it and I found an amazing friendship group there. Uh, we raced every weekend. We'd rush down there after school sport. We spent hours sitting on the wall. Um, and anyone that knows Brighton and Seacliff, the wall is very important out the front. Um, national championships were always at Christmas, and so all the parents drove us to all the regattas, um, and so we would head off to uh, Melbourne or Sydney or wherever the regatta was. So it was parents and kids and boats. Um, it was a really, really nice introduction back to Australia for me. That was grade 10, 11, 12, and it was just a great way to grow up. 
Um, I did move on um, from there, and this, in fact, um, is a race in Italy, I believe that photo is. Um, and it was my first um, Australian representation with the Sport 20 class. Uh, once again, a big eye opener, my first time to Europe, um, and 80 boats on the start line. But, you know, again, I met people from all over the world. Uh, we finished mid fleet uh, but I learned an awful lot along the way, and, and from there, the racing continued. Um, it really fed my dream to go to the Olympics, and I do remember as a child that um, we were asked what we wanted to do as, as um, we grew up. And I made a little poster, and my little poster said, I'd like to go to the Olympics, that's going to be my job. A little misguided, but uh, that was the um, plan. Um, I moved on to the double-handed Olympics 470 class, and the Olympic trials were actually in Adelaide for their 88 games in LA. Uh, and that meant that we had a lot of training here, we had a lot of attention for sailing in Adelaide. Um, I trained with some of the past Olympians who are Adelaideans. Uh, and we head to Europe to race in Germany, Italy, France for all the international experience. Uh, really, we're in development for a phase um, with the 470, and I shall move on to a photo of the 470 in a flat car. Um, but um, we did, took that uh, campaign another four years until uh, the trials of the 92 Barcelona Games. Um, we, my crew, Leslie and I, in this case, um, were third in the trials, and it's the first one that goes. But um, I move on. Uh, a new single-handed class called the Europe was introduced to Australia or introduced to the Olympics for the 96 Olympics. And so I moved to that. It was a, a way of um, selling independently. Um, the, most of the local races were in Melbourne and I would drive over on a Friday night, race all weekend, drive back on a, a Monday to work. Um, but uh, we had some very intensive racing there. Once I got back overseas, uh, I ended up uh, teaming up with a Norwegian girl, a Swiss girl, and a Danish coach. And it was a, a really wonderful um, setup that uh, uh, the Swiss girl was very, very good sailing upwind. Um, I was very good sailing downwind. And the Norwegian girl was an all-rounder. And then we had our Danish coach. So it was, it, it was non-competitive. We, we had a, a fantastic time training together. Um, I missed out on the 96 Olympics and the final um, race was in Ier in France. I remember it distinctly and it really came down to attack. So um, that's one that's kind of killed me through my life but I've continued on. Um, at, this, um, at this point I, had, I went and worked at the um, Atlantic Games and helped them training. And I was offered to um, fly up to Newport, Rhode Island in a double-handed, uh, sorry, sorry double-handed, on the sailor, in a two-person plane. And uh, that was with the press officer who I'd been working with in Atlanta. Um, and in fact, we were in Savannah, Georgia. And so I went and had a job interview and I got the job. Little did I know, I thought I was interviewing for a sailing yacht and I ended up on a powerboat. So we, we uh, took that boat down to the Caribbean and I actually spent a number of years working in the Caribbean. It was a wonderful life. I did a trip to Alaska, um, visited the largest uninhabited island in the world, Co Cocos Island, uh, which is off Costa Rica. Um, I remember dropping the anchor in 40 feet of water at night and seeing it hit the bottom. The water was just so cool. Uh, we transited the Panama Canal, uh, which is an engineering marvel. I worked on a 140-foot yacht um, called Murray Chateau, and that was to assist with an, with an Atlantic challenge to get the record for going across the Atlantic. The, um, it turns out, um, actually, that this was a pretty good life for me to pay off bills, and I, I did stay there for a while because um, I enjoyed it so much, and recently we did end up going back to Antigua, and I'll talk about that more, but um, just to catch up with old friends, and it's a, it's a good world. Um, what I really learned working on these big boats and working on rich owners' boats that were very expensive was seamanship. And so everywhere that uh, we moved these boats, the key and the most important thing was not to break the boats. 
uh, I got my yacht master in that time, and where I talked about the levels of training, then there is an offshore yacht master certificate, and after that, an ocean yacht master certificate, and it says that you can run a boat and that you know how to navigate, and um, that's a skill again that I took from that period of time, and it led me to my next role, and that was navigating offshore. Uh, I did come back to Australia in 99 and I got a, a job with Australian Sailing as their training manager. And as part of that, and based on my experience at sea at, at that point, I set up um, the two day safety and sea survival course for Australia. Uh, it really was initiated as a result of the 1998 Sydney to Hobart, where they had, it was a, mid, a super storm, it was a mid Atlantic low. Uh, sorry, mid-latitude low, and um, the seas across Bass Strait were really very challenging, breeze up to 80 knots, and there were six deaths in that race. So this uh, sea survival course, I remember clearly uh, with owners or you know sailors saying, I don't need to do that, I've been sailing for 200 years, I know everything. <laughs> yes, I understand that, I'm very sorry, but this has become a part of the requirement and we now have, it is for the ruling, it's 50% that have to have that um, qualification. Um, I continue to teach it, but um, it is something that we now have owners coming back to us saying, every single one of my crew has to have this. So it, it's a, a proud, I'm very proud of the course because it's also been taken worldwide and it is now the international course with World Sailing. Um, I went on to do a lot of offshore racing. Um, I went to Sydney, uh, did all the East Coast races, and um, lived in Sydney at that point. Port Lincoln races, Sydney to Hobart. Um, I was asked to join the All Women's team in the Volvo Ocean Race, and that was 2001, and that was as a navigator on um, Amersports too. I saw I'm a little behind with a couple of my photos, but I will fix those. That again is the Europe uh, dinghy there, and we've just got some cruising ones as we go. Um, trial by fire when I arrived for Amma Sports 2. Um, or if it's wind and waves, if we're talking in sailing talk. I arrived three weeks before the start of Around the World uh, Ocean Race to become the navigator. Um, I had some very helpful advice from my friends, and they said, Jen, keep the land on your left. <laughs> <laughs> It's very good advice, it was a little more complicated than that. Um, so we, um, uh, one of the stops actually was in Sydney and we arrived about two, two in the morning and we had uh, family, friends, a whole raft of boats that came out onto the water to meet us as we came in. Um, so James Hardy handed us with a glass of red wine uh, as we uh, hit the shore, which I'm pretty sure is not the usual um, uh, refreshment as you finish an offshore race, but it's, uh, it's a nice South Australian uh, touch there. Um, once that was all open, uh, over, I, it seemed natural to set up uh, my safety business. So I set up Marine Safety Works. And I remember very distinctly, I was introducing my new boyfriend, Ian, who is now my husband, to Peter and Helen. And uh, around the dinner table, we came up with this idea that um, using the safety skills from the sailing, using um, my background is in sports science, so teaching first aid, uh, is to set up a, a safety business, helping boats get ready for offshore racing. Um, that was 2004, and so I'm just coming up for my 20th year. Uh, I'm still running the business very much as I set it up with Dad. Uh, he came and helped do a, um, a business plan, as you might expect, and um, uh, I'm continuing to teach the Sea Survival course this year. I took a sailing sabbatical this year. Uh, really, it was after the challenges of COVID um, and the loss of Peter and Helen and Mum and Dad. Um, and that was either end of COVID. So Ian and I have been racing on a classic yacht called Kilo 2 for the past uh, seven years. Uh, the owners had bought it in Portugal. We joined her in uh, England, raced the first Fastnet race. Uh, Ian, in fact, brought her back to Australia with uh, some other crew. And um, we continued racing for the last seven years. It was then time to take her back to the UK for the 50th Fastnet race. 
Um, the fast net, race, fast net race has a history of uh, the 1979 race is probably what some of you would have heard of. There were 15 deaths in that race and it was a um, again, a very large storm that occurred during that race. It is one of the colder races of the um, offshore series. It's a challenging race. This year, during the start of the race, the first 12 hours were very challenging. Um, Kealoa 2 is a Sparkman Stevens um, uh, yawl. And I'll just pop a little photo up of her. So. Um, being a girl, she's got two masts. The aft mast is behind the rudder. Um, she's 73.5 feet long. She weighs 45 tonne, so she is a very heavy boat. And we race with 16 to 18 crew. Uh, she was bought, bought, built in 64 in California for the well-known owner Jim Kilroy, and he had uh, five pier lowers. Um, and we met his family, in fact, at the end of the Transpac race, which is LA to Hawaii. Uh, that was. Oh, I've missed my years. 2019, we did the Transpac race, and um, it was nice to meet his family. Um, she won most of the major World Asian races at the time when she was built, won the Sydney Hobart in 1971. The brothers who bought her, the Broughtons, were aiming to repeat all the races that she had competed in. So we did manage Fastnet, we did manage Transpac, we did manage the Hobarts, but COVID kind of got in the way for some of the American racing. So we didn't achieve that. Um, we, uh, the trip, um, we, it was a four month trip. It was 16 and a half thousand miles to get back to the UK. And um, she, uh, we went with a crew of six initially to New Zealand. Um, and as the trip went on, we had crew come and go. So, you know, the next leg was nine, then it was seven, then it was five, which was a little short and then six. So each leg was slightly different. Um, we left on January the 26th this year, 2023, and that was from Sydney to New Zealand, Opua in New Zealand. Uh, uh, we did some boat work there and actually we really needed to get going because it was a cyclone that was due to hit New Zealand. So when we left, we went straight east. We were due to go around Cape, Cape Horn and this was the carrot on why we went. It was going to end our round, the, end our lap for the skipper, for Ian, for me. Um, so, of course you plan for the cold, of course you plan for difficult seas. What we didn't plan for it was in the middle of the night, bang. Now, whenever someone describes a damage on a yacht, we heard something go bang. <laughs> it's a good description. So, what had actually, in fact it was a loud bang, um, <laughs> to be further descriptive. Um, we had broken the stem fitting and this boat was felt to be solid as a rock. Uh, but the stem fitting is the fitting that, if you can see on that photo, holds, in this case you can see a furling headsail, so that is the fitting on the deck that holds that in place and there is a big furling drum on it. Uh, that photo in fact is taken in Sydney Harbour. We had um, quite the day of racing in Sydney Harbour. Um, the furler force tow came banging down the side of the boat, broke, broke the uh, lifelines. So we needed an all hands call. We managed to lash it along a shroud. We got halyards forward to stop the rig from falling down. So we were very, very fortunate not to lose the rig. We were 10 days from Cape Horn, at least. We were 10 days from New Zealand. We were 10 days from Tahiti. Uh, at that point in time, one of the crew decided that we were closer to the space station than we were to anywhere <laughs> on the land. So it wasn't a, a, a situation of let's ask for help. Um, we had to figure out how to set up a jury rig, which is a way of um, it's a way of setting some extra sail out with what you've got left. So we spent eight hours cutting away all the parts that were very broken. Uh, we got. Uh, stay put back in place and we headed not back to New Zealand, that would be going backwards and there had been a, a um, cyclone, so we headed to Tahiti. The problem with Tahiti is it is very much upwind, it is very much the wrong way to go. So we got squalls, rain, shifts, upwind, upwind or no wind. 
So um, quite a long trip into Tahiti. And what it also then set up is then from Tahiti, we needed to go to Panama. Once again, not the right way to go because it is upwind, squally, no breeze. Um, we took another 34 days to get from Panama, to, sorry, from Tahiti to Panama. Um, we, being a racing yacht, she, we didn't have enough fuel to be able to every time it was light be motoring uh, at full steam. So there were times when we were actually sailing at a reasonably slow pace. Um, Within that, we had, and I did say, you know, a lot of squalls, a lot of um, the light air, a lot of really good sailing. So we did have some good sailing. Um, I spent hours and hours being able to steer the boat for hours on end. Uh, we had showers outside when it rained. I did manage to wash my hair, condition my hair, and dry it all in one session during one of the squalls. So I was very proud of myself on that one. Uh, normally speaking, we do have showers on board, but there is limited water. Um, the rest of the trip um, was an uplift wind slog from Antigua to Panama, uh, sorry, Panama to Antigua. Um, I did catch up with some wonderful friends in Antigua. The final leg, Antigua to the Azores, was really where we saw a lot of whale life, wildlife. Um, the trip. <laughs> I don't need to do another one. I've, I've gone all directions around the world, but it was something that I'm very, very proud to have done uh, with Kealoa. The final part of the uh, Fastnet race was that it was a solid race. This is, in fact, in a Sydney to Hobart um, race. That's me trimming there. Um, I do want to say the indelible memories, and that's the final bit. My indelible memories are the stars, the cloud patterns, the sunsets, saw a pot of wild pilot whales, basking sharks, fin whales, and one of the fin whales um, sat, uh, swam alongside us for a good five minutes. The bird life in the Pacific was amazing. Um, we run in watches, so we have two or three people on deck at any one time, and the discussions are varied and broad. Why do I go sailing? It can be wet, uncomfortable, miserable, but still we go. Uh, why do I have such a love of the ocean and more importantly a love of sailing? It's the combination of it all. I love the camaraderie of offshore sailing. Um, you're reliant on your own skills, you're reliant very much on your crew. At sea, in every moment, you're at the mercy and control of the elements. And your role is to work with those elements, to master your response to those elements, and to coax a vessel through those elements from one point to another. I'll just uh, show a couple more photos and uh, open it to questions if anyone's interested. Um, this is the trip that we ran from Australia and you will see uh, the left-hand turn halfway across between New, New Zealand and uh, um, South America and uh, very much you know, jumps as we went up. Um, it was cold. Uh, in fact, the last leg was the coldest, so almost colder than the Southern Ocean and um, we were pretty happy to get there by the end. Uh, I think perhaps this will be one of the nice ones, and this is the end of the fast rate race. Thank you. We have a few minutes for a question or two. Uh, would somebody like to start the ball rolling? There's one of the This is a, a practical question. So you described your, uh, the hair care routine, but how does food work on like these offshore long races? So for the racing, certainly for the Volvo Ocean Race, that was all freeze dried. And it, it's a combination of it will last for a long period of time and it is light. So all the yacht racing is all about keeping the boat light. Kealoa is quite different. She's got large freezers, so we prepared a lot of food ahead of time. And as far as fruit and veg went, we would start with the, anything that goes off first, the lettuces, the soft vegetables, and then we worked our way. I managed to keep crunch, which is what I called it, salad, 
um, on day 34, we, which was the last day of one of the leagues, we ran out that day. So it's a matter of um, choosing the right foods and you do get stews, but it's a, it's a matter of um, then just rationing it out. And we had a water maker for water. Where does electrical power come from? Uh, I've never done a long. Okay, so we have a generator, um, usually uh, diesel. So a diesel generator, we also had solar panels. So one of the solar panels was permanently fitted and we had another one that we put up on top of the uh, Bimini. And Genevieve, um, we now understand why Peter White, our past president, was such a supporter of youth going on the one and all and a few things uh, over the years. And uh, we often think of them uh, how they better. But I just wonder, um, uh, what would you say today with your science and safety background to somebody like Kay Cottage who many years ago uh, sailed around the, and sold around the world? What would you say to somebody that wanted to take that challenge on today? She did an amazing job. And she did it you know, on a yacht that was perfect for the for the role, for the job. Um, there's certainly been people who've done that since on, on race boats. What I think I'd do is take that st step further and say anybody can go sailing. People do learn sailing at a mature age. They learn at childhood, you know, in childhood. Um, it's about finding the right boat. It's about finding the right crew and um, enjoying the people that you're actually sailing with or enjoying your own company if you choose to do the, the single-handed. Um, a single-handed dinghy sailing, but I prefer the, the crude offshore. Double-handed sailing in Australia or in worldwide right now is absolutely blooming. So that is going to be the next uh, thing to look at is all the double-handed sailing in the offshore racing. I've just got one last one. We hear a lot about pollution in the Pacific, and the other thing that uh, when I have done offshore sailing in the Bass Strait, we're always worried about can't submerge the cave. Do you have much of the observations on that sort of thing? Generally speaking, Sydney to Hobart, um, it's the wildlife. Um, uh, sunfish can be a problem. Um, when off Newcastle, when the Pasha Volker, I think it was Pasha, uh, one of the ships lost a, a lot of. Um, containers there, then yes, it does happen. It's not my first thing to worry about is the containers. It, they're definitely going into Panama with a lot of rubbish in the ocean. Uh, and between Panama and Antigua, it was sargassum grass, and that's a real problem too. Um, it, just ocean, you could see a whole field of this so the sargassum grass. So different areas had different um, problems in the water. Certainly there was rubbish uh, in that lake and a lot of it. Okay. Thanks everyone. You know, uh, some people have interesting lives, some people have challenging lives, and somebody, some people have very interesting and very challenging lives. <laughs> uh, we've heard a story today of, uh, from, from Genevieve and her experiences as an international big boat sailor. Uh, I'm, I just listen to that stuff and I'm a bit of a sailor myself, or I have been, and I just, I'm just in awe of what she's achieved. Rotarians, please show your appreciation.